Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the uh, UCSD Emeritus Association uh, project of the our uh, oral history uh, of where we talk to um, various emeritus faculty about their own experiences at UCSD of their own experiences in the history of the, their own and of various programs that we have. And I, my name is Peter Gurevich. I'm a retired professor here in political science and international relations. And I'm very happy to welcome to you Anacelia Centella. And um, she is a, uh, a professor emerita in what she calls the field of anthropolitical uh, approach to linguistics. She is a specialist in the field of linguistics, but a particularly interesting subset of that, which is the field of bilinguality, of how people come to learn not only one language, but at least two or more. And that has been her uh, professional life's work. She's written quite a, a bit about this. She is herself a graduate of Hunter College and then an MA from Penn State University and uh, which if memory serves me is out in College Park in uh, way out in the middle of the state of Pennsylvania. And then she got a PhD in educational linguistics from the University of Pennsylvania, which if memory serves me correct is in Philadelphia. And um, uh, she's written a great deal on this theme and I think it's a uh, very fortuitous that we're having this discussion because it's a very, very important set of issues Worldwide, all over the world, people are, I think, interested in this as she has quite a lot of honors that reflect this. And so it's uh, particularly important in the United States as we have for uh, quite a lot of years been a multicultural society in which the issue of language is a particularly important one. I feel a personal connection Anna, to this one because I myself uh, grew up bilingual because I spoke Russian before I spoke English. I was born in New York City in uh, 1943 and my grandparents never learned English. So I started out speaking Russian and when I was four and a half and my parents realized that if I was gonna start uh, grade school, I had to learn English. So though they were quite poor as immigrants, they sent me to a school so that I could learn enough English to do kindergarten. I couldn't, I didn't have good enough English to do kindergarten. I was that bad off. So I learned, I learned enough English to do kindergarten. So we have lots and lots to talk to. Uh, talk. Uh, well, we have a lot in common because, of course, I was born and raised in New York. And yes. um, I had uh, many neighbors who spoke different languages. Yes. And, uh, but mainly from them, I learned Yiddish. You learned Yiddish. I never learned a word of Yiddish. I didn't learn any oh, Yiddish. Boy. I come from a Jewish background, but yes. my Yiddish was not a family uh, language. It was not a lingua franca in my family. They spoke Russian, French, and German before they mastered English. But Well, my neighbors, I'll never forget this, had yeah. purple tattoos on their arms. Yes, for reasons we know. And, and uh, I... Uh, tragic. Yes. Yes. And yeah. my mother worked with many uh, people in the garment industry, similarly. Yeah. And so they spoke more Yiddish there than they did English. So that's I how can, I can, that's very fascinating. Well, fortunately, we don't have to talk about that degree of depressing topic. We can talk about the bilingual, the issues that fascinated you. Talk about today's <laughs> depressing <laughs> attitudes yes, to bilingual. So far. Uh, but the very fascinating topics of, uh, of bilinguality and multilinguality and what that means for human beings and their cultural as well as their political development. So let's start out. There's so many things to talk about. Let's start out with a question of uh, how you came to UCSD uh, from this origin in New York, this fascinating origin. How is it that you came to US UCSD? What motivated you to come here? Well, after many years in City University, I uh -huh. taught at the university where I had uh, studied as an undergraduate at Hunter College. Uh -huh. And um, after I wrote an award-winning book there, um, and my husband was a severe asthmatic living in New uh -huh. York, 
Um, I had spent the year at Stanford um, and uh, was interested in moving to California for his help. But it really was um, an ad that I ran across while I was on a bus uh, reading uh, the anthropology newsletter. Mm -hmm. And this ad from the UCSD Ethnic Studies Department was at the bottom of a page. I'd never seen anything like that before. And oh. when I called my best friend and read her the ad, she said, wait, does it start by saying attention? And I said, yes, and they, yeah, because it was so written with uh, as if it had been uh, written specifically for me. And so um, I did reach out and of course, uh, connected with Charles Briggs at the time and realized that it was someplace where I, in fact, could do a lot of very good work and be on the other coast that represented the other half of my life. Because could I had, you, could you say my what, you, what was it? What was it about it that you felt specified you? It said they wanted somebody who was committed to uh, languages and um, uh, issues of. Uh, race and class and ethnicity mm -hmm. uh, and who had uh, you know experience in teaching this and studying different mm -hmm. communities and so it, it was just so uh, directly um, mm -hmm. in my in my bailiwick um, so that was uh, definitely what made me um, want to come over here and when I arrived and I soon decided, okay, I was going to call a realtor and ask her to find me a place. She said, when's the interview? I said, that's tomorrow. She said, are you kidding? <laughs> I said, believe it or not, this is for me. It just was so, so very much um, what I, the kinds of things. And since I had spent all my life studying all of the Latino communities in New York, some of whom, in, especially after the 80s, were Mexican. Mm -hmm. That connected me to that part of my heritage, which is my Mexican father. Mm -hmm. But I was mainly immersed in the Puerto Rican community with my Puerto Rican mother and my husband. Uh -huh. So I decided that the West Coast would get me more connected to another part of the country and look at the issues of bilingualism, especially on the border, um, that I was very interested in. Uh -huh. Could so you say more about the particular conception of doing ethnic studies that connected to the bilinguality? I mean, I, I would guess, you know much more about this than I do, but I would guess that not all ethnic studies programs would put by language as center stage at that time, at any rate, I, I say more about what's distinctive. I'm trying to get a, kind of you to document what's distinctive about your work and how you wanted to define and shape the study of ethnicity and connect it to language. I want to make it kind of more explicit in our conversation. Could you say more about that? Well, um, every time you talk, someone else makes a judgment about where you're from and what you're worth, mm -hmm. which is why I coined anthropolitical linguistics, mm -hmm. point out that besides this look at, at the structure of languages, which is what I did with my quantitative background, but mm -hmm. also look at the community's use of language, which is what I did with the anthropological study of hanging out in El Bloque for you know, months and years, um, having children wear tape recorders so that I had actual language in all the settings. Those mm -hmm. two pieces don't really get understood unless you look at the social structures and the political and economic structures that are shaping the way families raise their children and the way people interpret the ways we speak. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely um, a link to... Uh, in other words, our ethnicity is racialized and so is our language. And in many cases, people are not allowed to say anything about your race, especially in the, you know, what period of, uh, not in public with the microphone on at any rate, but certainly um, the racist comments persisted. But what was possible to say in public 
were all these outrageous comments about how people spoke and what their accent was and what their grammar was. And if uh, black people couldn't speak uh, English right. Um, and all of these comments uh, that I um, was uh, looking at for years in New York. And so I wanted to see what the uh, framework was over here um, on the border close to Mexico. Was there something about the border that was, uh, I, I, this is a very fascinating thing. So you wanted us to think, be more aware. You were like George Bernard Shaw and My Fair Lady. You wanted us to be more self-aware. I'm sure many people have said this to you. I apologize. <laughs> but uh, you wanted us to be more aware of the political implications of the way we spoke, that that was a topic, that was a subject matter that you thought people weren't paying enough attention to, that we should be more aware of the uh, political overtones of uh, and the that, and, these, and these are policies at the local level, at the very local level. These are school policies, whether or not children were hit for speaking another language in a classroom. These are policies at the community level, whether or not there are doctors and nurses uh, uh, who are able to speak to the patients from very different communities that come in. These are issues that are at the state level, whether or not there are um, organizations that are addressing um, the needs of different communities. And of course, nationally, um, what is the um, political uh, environment uh, surrounding bilinguals, but also what policies specifically support or do not support um, these different areas where um, bilingualism needs to be uh, respected. Mm -hmm. and, and do you see, are there situations in which there's more respect for this in, uh, than compared to other situations? I mean, when do people when does to, do you observe the tolerance is higher or lower in various situations or oh yes when i see a um uh, a very um anglo looking person talking a language they get some respect much more than when i talk in a no in, no that isn't that's not I would go well that's what i mean like, no what i meant is what, what i mean do, do you see do you see higher different levels of tolerance. I, I was saying, are there situations where there's more tolerance or less tolerance of difference? Well, I think, you know, depending upon whether or not you're a politician going to stud, to meet uh, somebody else in another country and uh, you need that language, there's more tolerance there. But mm -hmm. that's not what is affecting the lives of all of the millions of people um, who are, you know, struggling uh, to have their languages respected here. So mm -hmm. yes, there are those, and there are also very big differences in the Latino communities. Mm -hmm. Who thinks the Spanish of this group is better than the Spanish of the other group? And so they're mm -hmm. more willing to tolerate that also. There are all those internal divisions that I have studied and documented. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in all of that. And yeah. of course, on the border, I'm interested in what happens when people can live and work on two sides of the border with different demands on their language skills and also on their identities as they cross from one side to the other. Yeah, what have, what have, you, what have you learned and observed about the border that's different from, I mean, New York is an interesting place, but it's not next to the border except the ocean border. But. But uh, what do you observe about you? Now you've been out here for many years in California. What do you notice about being on the border that's very interesting to you? Well, I have written two major articles on this. One is about the people who cross to, uh, who've been crossing for years, who live in Tijuana and cross to study in San Diego, either in universities here or in the high schools here. That's a very, um, significant study, and that um, pointed out the extraordinary labels that are they get used to being labeled X, Y, or Z. I, I can mention all those labels. They're in my articles. People yeah, sure. know them, yeah. but at any rate, everything from naco to pocho to mocho, and those um, and the impact of the, those on their studies and on their self-respect and self-esteem and their belief and their attitudes towards the their languages and their countries. So mm -hmm. that 
was very important. And on the other hand, then I studied a high school on the border, the border high school, which is very close to the border in the US. Mm -hmm. And I studied the 19 different social uh, groups there that wow. I by around specific ways of speaking Spanish or English, clothes, mm -hmm. jewelry, uh, dancing, music, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And that was very interesting. What I found was that um, in all of these places, there was a dismissal of Spanglish, which is something I have devoted my life to, and uh, especially the book Growing Up Bilingual, um, about Puerto Ricans in New York. Um, but the other, uh, the and that was so interesting that I have a young woman uh, from uh, the high school who says, um, they're always mixing Spanish and English y no deben hablar así. In one sentence, she does it herself and she's denouncing it. <laughs> and I have many examples of that conflict um, of the uh, ways in which they've learned to dismiss a very valuable and very um, important uh, skill, a linguistic skill. It's not- How do you a interpret that? Why is she so dismissive of it? Because everybody hates it and everybody puts it down and the teachers yeah. put it down and the, yeah. uh, you know, um, I understand that there's a, someone just told me this, that the actful test um, for Spanish, is uh, if you say one word in English, you fail. So this kind of yeah. idea that a bilingual is two bi two brains stuck together with one tongue uh -huh. is very, very damaging sense of how bilingualism works in the brain. I'm not talking about the kinds of things that the Peace Corps volunteers that I trained in Spanish yeah. and yeah. With, after two years would say, yo, compro, Tiqueto, buy a flyo uh, to Kansas mañana. That is not Spanglish. That is not knowing Spanish and mixing English with it in ways that they don't know the rules. But the children that I saw from ages six to uh, 18 were able to fluently move from one language to the other at the syntactic points that honored the structure of English and the structure of Spanish in 1600 switches. Wow. Wow. So the quantitative aspects of it are proof of the extraordinary ability um, that these bilingual children have. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted uh, the youth over here also, uh, I wanted to show them that their, their switching was also very uh, rule governed and uh, a very strong um, indication of their strong bilingual skills. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do we know about bilinguality in terms of its uh, impact upon uh, brain and personal development in other respects? In other words, how does it, does it correlate with other things about how you are learning and skill development? Well, there's, sure, there's all kinds of research now on, um, the fact that my uh, dementia will take a little longer than yours, Peter, uh, if you still, unless you still know the Russian. I do. <laughs> oh, well, then you're- Well, I've learned other languages. I speak actually much more fluent than my Russian is my French. I've learned to speak French. I speak oh, well, French then, French. You, yeah. then you will, then you will, uh, then the, uh, and the studies show that the bilingual brain has uh, somewhat more of a resistance to um, the plaques. Oh, that's, and, is that right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, that's nice. And you and I it's can- not, It's not gonna remove them and it doesn't yeah. end it, but it slows it down. So we can dotter along with our canes a little longer than, than the other. <laughs> what have you found? Uh, um, what other, uh, how have you found uh, linguistics, I mean, not linguistics, ethnic studies department as a structure, as an institution uh, how, uh, here? I, I mean, I don't want you to, I'm, yeah. I mean, what is your observation of, of the institution of this uh, kind of field? Well, um, I came from the only 
Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies uh -huh. in the entire United States. Wow. That we started at Hunter College. Wow. It's now called uh, African American and Latino slash Puerto Rican Studies. Uh -huh. But that um, was a merging of these groups that um, I found very important and very powerful. And so, whereas other places had asked me to go into Spanish departments or English departments or yeah. English departments, yeah. I didn't see them doing the kind of cross-ethnic and um, yes. work that I wanted to pursue. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, uh, that was very important to me to see that there was going to be respect for diversity of languages and uh, backgrounds. And so I was very happy also like four years ago, although I've been retired since before that, uh, to start at UCSD, the annual celebration of International Mother Language Day. Hmm. Which, I didn't know we had that. Tell me, tell us about that. What is oh, that? Well, I will have to, I don't know how you missed it. We're out on the we're out uh, in front on Library Walk, and we also uh -huh. have a marvelous Zoom session. Uh -huh. uh, and I also reach out to the local high schools. Uh -huh. uh, we also uh, reach out to the local libraries. Yeah. And MOVE is now um, widespread across California and across the US. International Mother Language Day is February 21st, every February 21st, because on that day, in um, 1959 or so, I'm not sure, the, the um, Bengali, four Bengali students were murdered for protesting the imposition of Urdu on the community. And mm. as a result, UNESCO declared February 21st, the day they were murdered, uh, International Mother Language Day. Mm. And um, we are encouraged everywhere to support that. Uh, at UCSD, we have made marvelous posters with uh, QR codes that here um, we've recorded over 68 languages spoken on the campus by workers, by um, students, uh, and which they say they are, uh, it's a welcoming message in their language. Um, and they say, um, I am so-and-so, I speak X from Y, and I want you to know that I respect your language and culture. We had mm -hmm. them coming out through the talking trees. Oh yeah, how great, yes. Mm -hmm. And we had them also, um, you know, uh, we had students who were helping us do more recordings uh, every year on the, on the library walk. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, it's been very, very important and, and a wonderful collaboration with the linguistics program, with the anthropology uh, library and, and students in, in these different groups. That's really, that's terrific. And I, by the way, we had all these QR codes and one of the people uh, that I interviewed was Chancellor Kosla. Oh, great, good for you. That he recorded his message also. Oh, that's great. Which language did he do that in? <laughs> well, he had to call somebody um, to get the help with the Hindi, so uh. <laughs> yeah. that's very interesting. That is a that is a very uh, interesting. Huh, great. What have I not asked you that you would like to articulate as a distinctive contribution that you feel you were able to make to your field in your years here at UCSD? Well, there are just so many different things, but I'm. Um, uh, I was on the Preuss board, and yeah. I have been a supporter of Preuss and a right. mentor to the Preuss uh, high school students yeah. uh, for a long time because I think education is critical. Um, I um, would like to see, and uh, this is one of the issues that we're trying to address with this new group that's just formed on bilingualism in California, I would yeah. like to see, especially since UCSD is is what is called an emerging HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution, mm -hmm. that in fact it serve the Hispanics and not be served by the Hispanics only. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that that would involve courses in Spanish in different departments. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, astounded by the fact that there are no courses in Spanish in many of the UC court, uh, campuses for people who do speech pathology and are mm -hmm. trained in speech pathology, even though one of the largest communities they're going to be helping is, a Sp is the Spanish speaking community. Um, and we need uh, different courses in, in courses in different languages um, throughout um, uh, yeah, the, the university. I, mm -hmm. I hope that um, uh, that UCSD will in fact continue to support, you know, um, diversity initiatives and uh, uh, moving towards this uh, uh, Hispanic serving institution. Um, uh, uh, it's an award really, you get funds for that. And so it's important that those funds be put to good use for the students who are um, most in need. And mm -hmm. know right. that a lot of them come from families that are still struggling and yeah. that are facing not only economic problems, yeah. but issues of uh, fear of, I have had students and I have been with people, with young people in cars, terrified when we are passing um, the border patrol uh, yes. truck, or when they we've been stopped, and they've been uh, you know stopping taking people out of cars. That's um, terrifying. Yeah. yeah, terrifying moments. Yeah, I think that's why I'm here. <clears throat> I came to the West Coast to see that um, in Carne Hueso uh, to experience it personally. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that those are the issues, no matter what you're teaching, I don't care if you're teaching political science, uh, that is, you know, the kind of history of governments, et cetera, um, or uh, nation states, uh, or you're teaching chemistry. It seems to me that um, we have to be concerned about the issues that are surrounding whether or not our students are able to lead a decent life. Yeah. And what, whether they feel safe. That's and right. whether they feel safe, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that's true. And you know, of course, what happened a few years ago with the chemistry professor who shouted at the workers outside the room that he was teaching in because he heard them um, making some noise while they were working. Uh, you don't know this? I'm not sure I remember the story that you're speaking about. Uh, well, uh, in 2022, I think it was, um, he yelled that the students, uh, he, he, he turned around from teaching the class and yelled at the workers, Arriba, Arriba, Andale, Andale. Mm. And then he turned to his students and he said, how do you say quiet in Mexican? Oh my God. And then he said, if they start coming with guns and knives, let me know. Mm. That man is teaching now. He, um, he was let, he was taken out for a while and then he was um, told, uh, he apologized and the whole free speech movement got involved and he is teaching this course. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think that those are the only problems. I think we're all involved in this. Mm -hmm. And so I always cite Bourdieu and talk about our complicity that authoritarians don't get to do their damage without the support of those they're being, that they're um, uh, controlling. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very clear about um, the stakes and how high they are and how much um, if we are privileged enough to be professors uh, or to be students, how many other people need our support and our help. Mm. And that's where our research and our free time should go. So mm. I um, am very involved in the Justicia Social or Social Justice Committee in my local church. We do a lot of work on everything from 
making sure that people try to get out to vote, to helping them register, to also um, looking at the housing problems across the state and the homeless issues, et cetera. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think that um, those of us who are retired, um, besides dealing with the achaques of vejez, which is the aches and pains, uh, and the serious sometimes medical issues, um, we should devote our time in very worthwhile ways. The right. best thing I'm doing now is teaching an ESL class on Tuesday nights at my church. The first time uh, I organized it, a very beginning class, this woman showed up in her early 50s with a tiny pencil and notebook. And she said, it's at six o'clock. She said, I had to tell my children that I didn't couldn't have dinner with them tonight because I wanted to be on time for the class because this is the first time in my life I'm going to be a student. Wow. What's the class that you're teaching? English. That, that particular class, what was the class about? English as a second language. Oh, ESL. ESL. Yeah, it's an for English you. class for beginning English uh, for, for people for English. Yeah. I have one more question for you because I know one of my colleagues likes to ask this question, which is, do you remember how you first got interested in this field? Do you remember what, is there a trigger point for you that you can remember what took you down? I mean, I don't mean in college or high school. Well, I mean, to um, make me call it anthropolitical linguistics, I think, was um, being uh, exposed to great researchers um, from the quantitative point of view uh, and also from the qualitative point of view. Mm. Um, but then understanding that there were so many of these power issues that needed to be uh, addressed. Mm. But the whole field of language uh, was, I was raised in this. I don't raised in the South Bronx in a tenement with a Puerto Rican mother and a Mexican father with neighbors who spoke Yiddish and Italian. I mean, I learned the difference between pasta fazul and fangul very early. And not to mention, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, what a shiksa was. Uh, and um, all of these different uh, influences um, became uh, very important to me. And so it was clear that I was interested in languages and I start right. very early on. Um, that I, I, <laughs> it's interesting. I find that a very understandable answer. It's always been with you. I mean, I, I would find it's it was your life. These kinds of questions surrounded your life. Yes. So it's very hard to specify a specific given moment. Yeah. That they're they're part of you. They're there. They're with you. And so you've studied these things. They you're observing your your uh, intellectual person, and you start observing them and uh, thinking and reflecting upon them and thinking of how they affected the world around you and what could you do about it. So, okay, well, I think uh, that has uh, consumed our time and we could go on for a lot of time talking about these things, these issues, but I really found this very interesting and I think it's a, a wonderful uh, summary of a few very fascinating topics. And as you say, these are very with us. These are, I applaud you for your early interest uh, in this field and taking a leadership role and helping to develop it and uh, being there. Well, I'll, count, I'll, I'll count on you for February 21st. For... Yes, I'll remember it. It's very easy to remember. It's the day of my, my okay. late brother's birthday. So okay. I remember that day. So, okay. Thanks very much.